Please join me in welcoming Mr. Damon Owens. Good afternoon, men. What a joy and a privilege to be with you. And um, I think I have to say, just in terms of disclosure up front, it's just good being around testosterone. <laughs> however, however minimal or maximal you think you may have, I, I live in what you might call an estrogen-enriched environment. <laughs> My wife Melanie and I have been married for 22, coming up on 23 years, and the Lord has blessed us with eight beautiful children. All of them boys, except the first seven. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, it's just the way I choose to look at the world. You know, you can look at it any way you want to. But I have a, an estrogen-enriched environment. And of, of the many things, and there's been so many just beautiful graces the Lord has done uh, for so many years, and so much comes to my heart, comes through uh, my mind, comes through all of the, the theology, the philosophy, but most everything that comes to me when I have the privilege of being at men's conferences is uh, really just, I'm Melanie's husband. I'm Melanie's husband. I'm father to Naomi, Leah, Rachel, Therese, Colette, Veronica, Olivia, and Nathan. I've been on the West Coast for the last day or so, and Nathan calls me any time of the day, and he's like, Dad, when you're coming home, let's play dodgeball, you know? In all the years of my girls, they've never called me to ask me that, you know? If I don't hit him when I walk by, he thinks something's wrong, you know? If he doesn't hit me, I know something's wrong, you know? There's just a, a, a joy when we can live and know this beautiful distinction but importance of what it means to be man what it means to be male. And when we understand that in the fullest sense of our masculinity, masculinity only makes sense in light of femininity. Let me just think about it, just objectively. To be masculine makes no sense if there were no such thing as feminine. And vice versa. Femininity takes its deepest meaning in light of masculinity. We can understand all of this without any theology, without any philosophy, without even much of any training. It's a human encounter and experience. We come to know who we are in relation to other people. Amen? We come to know the things that make us angry in a heartbeat, the things that bring us joy in a heartbeat, the things that are difficult for us to do, the things that are very easy and joyful for us to do, that come, in a sense, naturally. We come to realize all these things in and through relationships with other people. And what's beautiful about not just our Catholic faith, but really how God reveals himself to the world, what's beautiful about all the theology, the study and the meaning of God, of the philosophy, the study and the meaning of wisdom, of all the great sciences that you can understand, what's beautiful is that we can come to know these truths just by being searchers of truth just by living our life, trying to be happy, trying to be joyful, looking for those things that bring us joy, avoiding those things that bring us pain and suffering. We come to know the world and creation, at least in a basic sense. We come to know what's good and what's bad, at least in our own worldview. We come to know what brings us pain and what brings us joy. And what I think is beautiful, really a revelation of beauty, is that those experiences continue to teach us not just about the natural world around us, but the natural world around us helps us enter into the supernatural. And the supernatural, anytime you hear supernatural, you think God. When we think about or meditate or pray or contemplate or ponder divine heavenly mysteries, the only way that we can do those is through the natural, is through the senses, is what we see, what we smell, what we hear, what we taste, and what we touch. We are imminently sensual people. And whether we're pondering our masculinity or the things that bring us joy or how we're going to live our lives or we look in the mirror trying to figure out who we are, these are all experiences that are mediated through our senses. I want to begin here because when we come together as men, 
even for a few hours to talk about Jesus, to talk about the Catholic faith, to talk about what it means to be a man, we come all in from different places. And you all came here in different ways. Some of you drove, some of you ran, some of you were drug. Some of you still don't know why you're here. And our relationship with Christ, our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with church is as unique as we are. And there's a, there's a diversity, an authentically beautiful diversity in how we are in relationship with God that doesn't compete with one another, but when we get able to see it rightly, it actually helps us to see God more clearly. In one sense, we trust our senses because that's the only way that we can mediate the world, that we can actually move in between. And yet we have also the reality that we can't allow our senses to merely define what's true. There has to be something else, and that maturity as we grow helps us to enter into measuring and organizing and understanding and sometimes just encountering those relationships. Just as human as that is in our own lives, just as natural as that is in living and breathing and waking up and interacting throughout the day, it is also supernatural. It is how God comes to us, and it is how He is asking us to come to Him. Our faith, particularly as Catholics, is very sensual. We have smells and bells, and we have feast days, and we have fast days. We have beautiful stained glass. We have things that are meant to elevate us through our senses and our music. All these things are the natural mediators for us to enter into supernatural realities. Now, I wanted to begin there because as we talk a little bit more about mercy, we talk a little bit more about living out the fullness of our, our manhood and masculinity, these aren't things that are abstract from what you already know. You already know much of what is good, true, and beautiful. And our struggle isn't so much trying to discern what's right and what's wrong, it's doing it. It's having the courage to do what we know is good and to avoid what we know is evil. And there are two ways, in many ways they're not disconnected, but two ways that we experience it and the way God has approached us about it. And a simplistic way is looking at the scriptures themselves, looking at the Bible. Now, if you look at the scriptures, 73 books in the Bible, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant, 46 books in the Old Covenant, 27 books in the New Covenant, in many ways, it's God revealing himself to man. But more than just a gathering of stories, more than just a moral prescription, more than just a gift of life, it really is a family album. It's as if instead of the three score and ten, as Scripture says, the 70 years that we get, we can actually have the life history of generation after generation after generation, not just in the past, but what God has revealed also about the future. And when we speak about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, we're not speaking about an obsolete old one and the, and the updated new one. It's about understanding how they work and build on one to the other. Our church teaches that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So we study the saints, the, 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 the prophets, we study the wisdom books, we study the history books, we study the poetry. We read all of these things not to get locked into a particular law, but to recognize what God has revealed over time for us right now. What are we supposed to know and understand about who God is? Because that is the first and fundamental question. Who is God? And far again from being an abstract question from our own everyday life, it's the foundation of what it means to be Christian because we believe that we are made in the image and likeness of God. This is a phrase taken out of the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. And our scriptures begin 
in telling this story. From Genesis to Revelation, all 73 books from Genesis to Revelation is a story that basically is a three-act play. A three-act play. Creation, a fall, and redemption. It's the entire faith. Creation, fall, and redemption. It's the salvation story. So when we read, whether it's the Old Covenant or the New Covenant, when we read the commandments of the Old or we read the New Commandments in the New, it's all part of this three-act play that our forefathers in the faith and that you and I continue to play a role in. And we need to know where we are in the play. We need to know what happened in different stages of the play so that we can know how we ought to act and live now for what? For our joy to be complete. Not so that we memorize every commandment, not that we, we understand every nuance of the moral law, but that we have a burning desire. Imagine this. A burning desire in our hearts to love. Have you ever had a, a burning desire for anything in your life? It, it could have been as, as a little kid. It could have been, you know, when I, was, when I was nine, I got my first motorcycle. My dad got me a little mini bike, a little Honda MR50. I love this thing. I was looking at it for about a year, and I was like, oh, I wish I could have it. I wish I could have it. I wish I could have it. My heart was burning for this thing. It could be as simple as that. And when I got it, it was joy. But there's a difference when something is burning in our heart than even when we kind of want something or we do it because we ought to. The burning in our hearts speaks about the heart being the inner man, the deepest center of our being. And when that's on fire, it radiates out from us in a way that we really, we don't control. We direct, but we don't control it. It is a force. So when our hearts are burning for God, our hearts are burning for love, we can't help but love. And this is the call of this salvation story. Not that we sit into a box and that we follow rules. Not that we just do what we ought to do. That was actually more closely to how God began to reveal himself in the Old Covenant. The creation story of Genesis 1 and 2 begins way before any of the drama that you and I deal with now. It's the beginning of the story of God creating perfectly. And there are two main stories about this creation moment. It's the same creation event looked at, in a sense, from two different views. Genesis 1, as we call the, the objective creation story, where it's the story of creation from God's view to man. And it's very ordered. It begins with nothing. In the beginning, the earth was dark and void, and the Spirit of God hovered above the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was. And we begin this seven-day account that the poet uses to help us understand how God creates from nothing to everything in creation. And in this seven-day account, it's all described in each of its creation moments as being good. Now, in a world now where everything is awesome, everything is, you know, supreme, we hear good and we're like, eh, it's good. <laughs> good is as good as it gets. When God says something's good, that means it is perfect. It is a reflection of him. It is goodness. On the first day, God separated the light from the dark, and it was good, day one. On the second day, he put the dome in the middle of the sky to separate the waters above and below, and it was good, day two. On the third day, he moved the waters below into a basin to reveal the dry land, and it was good, day three. Then on days four, five, and six, God goes back in this poetry to fill in what he created through separation. This is why on day four, he goes back to the light and the dark, and he fills it with the stars and the sun and the moon. And then on day five, he takes the, the waters above and below, and he 
fills them with the birds in the air and the beasts and the, the critters in the sea, creatures. Then in the morning of the sixth day, he puts the creepy things and the beasts and the cattle on the dry land that was revealed moving in that water into the basin on day three. Then something profound happened. Now, this is poetry. It's, if, if, if I, the, the recovering engineer, can, can talk about poetry, you can do it too. Po- poetry is not the B team. You know, you see the poets, it's like the poetry. Y'all, y'all the ones who can't get jobs, you know? No, that's, that's, that's what, no. Poetry allows us to enter into a wisdom and truth that science cannot enter. Cannot. Science is the beautiful wisdom and knowledge of understanding the created world. But if it hasn't been created yet, how can you study it? Poetry allows us to enter into supernatural wisdom and truths that can't be taken apart to figure out how they work. Poetry puts things together so that we can see what they mean. And in the putting together, God creates the light and the dark. The waters above and below moves the water below for the dry land, fills them now with these creatures. And in the middle of day six, there's almost a pause in this poetry where God says, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness, in the image and likeness of God, he created them, and he blessed them, and said, be fruitful and multiply. Now, anybody who's even started a Bible study gets that far. Like January, you start, I want to read the whole Bible this year. Everybody gets through Genesis. So that it's kind of church talk. It's kind of a phrase that's familiar enough with us that we know, oh yeah, made in the image and likeness of God. Oh yeah, I get it. But it's as if God reaches down into his deepest being, his essence of who he is, and says, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. And the question is, what does that mean? to be made in the image and likeness of God. Well, the first clue we have is in this same description. The first clue. Because in the dense poetry, in the, in the tight wording of this creation poetry, it's worth noting that the first description of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God is the creation of sexuality. Male and female, he created them, is the first description after let us make man in our image and likeness, in the image and likeness of God, he created them. Male and female, he made them, and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. It's at least a first clue. Pressing in, St. John Paul II drawing on the tradition of our faith and his own philosophy and poetry asks the question, how can our sexuality, how can our masculinity and femininity be the image and likeness of a God who is not sexual? He is neither male nor female. He created sex when he created us. But when he created us sexual, it was meant to be a revelation of the deepest truth of who he is. What, what, what is this? How can our sexuality be the revelation of the deepest truth of God when he is not sexual? And in a simple word, I say simple because if it was easy, we wouldn't have a Theology of the Body Institute. We wouldn't have a church to help us usher and walk through. But the simple explanation is communion. Communion common union, that the deepest truth about God is not the distinction of masculine and feminine, which he does not have, but he created masculine and feminine stamped into the very bodies of these creatures meant to reveal him, 
because the two together create something that neither individually can. It's a common union of equal beings whose union itself is a revelation. Again, we have such scientific minds that we think in order to understand something, in order to figure it out, we've got to take it apart to see what it, how it works. Now, I, I love this. I'm an engineer. I, 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 yeah, you want to know how it works? You open it up, take it up, get the screwdriver. How does it work? But religion actually comes from a, a word that means to bind. Religion brings things together in order to see what they mean. Not apart to see how they work. Put them together to know what they mean. So the key here is what God is revealing even in this poetry is that he himself is a communion of persons. Now for us as Christians, this is sort of yeah and. But the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, it is an astounding revelation, literally unveiling, that God, the supreme being, the creator of all, first of all, creates other creatures, then creates them in his image and likeness, and then endows those creatures with the deepest truth about who he is, and furthermore, gives those creatures, you and me, the ability to know and to love the created God, creator God. It's astounding. What we do on a daily basis, God willing, in crossing ourselves, is the deepest mystery of the universe. That God himself is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Now, most of us, if we grew up Catholic, I come from a strong Catholic family. My father's a deacon, retired deacon, and my, my mom's, you know, generations Catholic. We have our pile of Catholic stuff. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We have our pile of Catholic stuff. And I say this with, with awe and reverence. I really do. This is how we teach our children. This is what Melanie and I are teaching our kids. This is what every parent wants to teach them. You need to know how to genuflect. You need to know the sign of the cross. I got one daughter who insists on using her left hand. I got another one who keeps going like, you know, like she's from the Eastern Orthodox, you know? <laughs> There's nothing wrong, but we teach them the stuff. They need to know the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Ten Commandments, in order, backwards, quiz. But we need to know these things, the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy. We need to understand the scriptures and the Bible and all these things. It's a pile of stuff in the beginning. Because there's all kind of information, there's all kind of things out in the world. And as we start to learn the what's of the faith, they, they're almost like dry bones. It's like a pile of, of, you know it's supposed to be worthy because your mom and dad said so. Because father said so. But to be honest, when we learn it, it's just a pile of stuff. And for most of us, for 45 minutes or an hour a week, we kind of go through the pile and start using some of that thing, and then we move on to our next pile, the pile at school, and then we got the pile at the office, we got the pile with our friends. There's things that we possess. But some of you know, there's a moment where those pile of, of dry bones start to move. They, they start to, to animate. And they're not just things outside of us. They start to mean something to us. They start to move us. They start to connect us with the deepest truths of who we are. They start to answer questions that we're asking. And sometimes they help us with the questions we ought to be asking. And as we live and as we experience, we start to see this is a treasure. There's a truth in here amidst all the noise, amidst all the opinions, amidst all the anger, and all the, the partisan, all the, everybody's angry and everybody's got an opinion. And everybody's got a website. And if they don't, they're on your website, enter into your comm box. You're an idiot. And in the midst of all this anger and all this opinionated anger, 
there's this quiet stuff that for many of us has been sitting there since as long as we can remember. And as we grow in our faith, at some point, God willing, it has to happen. Because as that pile gets bigger, it actually gets annoying. I could say this. It gets annoying when it stays as a pile of dry bones. It becomes all that stuff I'm supposed to do. Yeah, 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 I'm Catholic. I'm Catholic. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to fast on Friday, but you know. Oh, yeah, no meat today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not supposed to because I'm Catholic. And we have to start here. We need to know what, what is. But if we look at the entire faith as something outside of us that's imposed on us, it's just annoying. And when something annoys us, we only have two choices. We either learn to ignore it, kind of marginalize it a little bit, or we kick it out of our life. Because we don't like to be annoyed. And the choice becomes, is this stuff that we have been taught, that we are aware of, that we know exists in the universe, does it matter? Does it matter? Can I achieve the dreams of my heart, the desires of my heart, can I get what I want without that? Can I be happy? Can I be joyful? Can I have all the things that I think will bring me happiness and joy without that? And for those who have the privilege of animating these bones, we come to see not only are these the truths, this is the answer to everything we desire in our hearts. And it moves from things outside of us imposed to things moved into our own hearts that set our hearts on fire. And they set us on fire, not to, trying to be poetic. They set us on fire. There's a burn in us. If that's true, then that must be, if this is what this is, I gotta tell everybody. Th there's a moment in the faith where all the stuff becomes a person. And if you've had all the phrases and all the church talk and all the, the familiar things of being in the faith, and you have that encounter, encounter with Christ, the bones just start moving. And they move into us to the point we are on fire we are moved in our own anima, in our own soul. It's just vibrating. Pope Benedict called it a resonance, a resonance. And I keep thinking about resonant frequencies, you know, like in, in glass and everything in matter has some certain sound frequency that when you reach it, will shatter it. And there's a resonance in our own heart that when we reach that pitch or that tone, it shatters all of the false things in our own heart, and it makes us now able to feel, to sense, to know in the deepest being of who we are what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. Not as an idea that we figured out, but we come to know it because we know it, because we know it, because we know it, and nobody can make, any, make us not know it. Now, most of us need that encounter well, we all need that encounter. Most of us need the time to have that encounter with Christ. And in many ways, it's not connected to your age. There are children who have it, and there are those who don't have it until their late years in life. But what we do know is, until we have that encounter with Christ, the faith is a burden. It's a weight. It's a heavy yoke. And the yoke is not poetic either. The yoke is the big, heavy, wooden thing that goes around an oxen's neck so that the, the oxen will go in the direction that you're, you're, you're driving it to. And it doesn't just go off wherever it wants to go. It's a big, heavy yoke that's drawing us to go where we don't want to go. How long are we willing to, to stand up to a yoke that's bringing us to places we don't want to go? Not very long. But Christ said, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Because where he's directing us is where we want to go once we realize it. 
And when we go where he wants us to go and we trust that he's taking us to the place that will bring us the deepest joy, the yoke and the burden is easy. Genesis 1 opens up in this creation story for us to see that from the very beginning, everything in the natural world is good and created directly by God to express his deepest truth and to serve us, to give us a capacity to become who who he created us to be. Now we move into the second creation story because we need a different perspective on this creation event to see the full story. The first one gave us someone from the the top-down view of this ordered creation from nothingness to this filled natural world. The second creation story literally begins on the ground. This one begins that the Lord God formed from the clay, the dust, the earth, a body, breathed his spirit into that body, and the poet says, man became a living being. So we see in this account, from another tradition of our older brothers in the faith, the Jews, that from man's perspective to God, God reached down to the very stuff of the earth to form the body, but it wasn't until the very breath of God breathed into that matter that man became a living being. That the first truth about who we are is that God created us directly, and he created us unlike anything else in creation. He created us with a body and with a divine, eternal spirit. Now, when God created persons, us, before there were only two other types of persons in all of creation. There were the angels, the angelic persons, who are pure spirit. And there's God, the divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When he created us, we're a whole nother order of persons. And our personhood can only be understood through the world that he created for us. That's why he formed us from the stuff of this earth and then breathed his divine spirit into this. And man became a living being. This body-soul composite, so united in body and soul, That you could speak about the body as the person. The person is a body. You could speak about the soul. The person is a soul. Because they both speak to the person in their unity. In fact, here's make it simple. What do you call it when you separate the body from the soul? That's death. That's not good. That's why we were never meant to die. Because we're never meant to be separated as a body and soul. This also helps us to know everything that is of death. Everything that separates is a philosophy or a theology of death. We'll come back to that later. But this story begins on the ground with God forming us. God takes this creature whose name in the Hebrew is right from the dust that he was made, Ha'adam. And Adam Ha is this dust man, earth man in the Hebrew. And he picks him up and puts him into this paradise, this pleasure park, this Eden, this garden that has all the delights that God has created for us. But God himself says, for the first time in either creation story, God says, it is not good. And he says, it is not good that man is alone. And I will find a helper, an opposite, an other depending on the translation. I will find a helper fit for him. Now, again, this is, this is important because God formed directly, and when God creates, God creates perfectly. There's nothing wrong with Adam. And yet God said it is not good that he is alone. Now, This is my little personal interpretation. Now, as an engineer, as a science, we, and I know this because my wife is a social worker, and we have two totally different visions of the world. Engineers know that problems exist to be solved. 
I just want to start at the beginning. My beautiful, delightful social worker wife, I've observed, problems exist so that you can talk about them. <laughs> and there's a beauty in the dialogue of the problem. Whether it's solved or not is, is you know, not as consequential as have we discussed it? So I think about this when I'm at this point of the scriptures in Genesis 2 where God says, here's the problem, it's not good. Here's the solution, I will find a helper fit for you. What should be the next line? Say it again. Problem solved, here she is. That's how I would have written scriptures. <laughs> but does anybody remember what happens after God says, and I will find a helper fit for you? What's the next part of that scripture? Just say it out loud. The sleep, not before the sleep. Say it again. He asked him to name the animals. Now, is that not a biblical commercial break? I mean, I mean, come on. This is God. This is God, and he's creating at the moment of creation, and he creates man, and he puts him in Eden and says, it's not good that you're alone. I will find a helper fit for you. Would you name the animals? <laughs> it's actually funny. In the theology of the body, John Paul II's audience says, he actually, he's, he's kind of silly like that. He says, it seems to be a strange turn. So there's a phrase in there. He says, what could be happening here in this poetry? And without you know, the time to go into all of it, there's something profound that God is both respecting and teaching Adam before he can receive his helper fit for him. He names, God asks him to name the animals, and Adam does something crucially important. He says yes. He obeys. Now this isn't the obedience like, name the animals. Yes, daddy. He asked him to name the animals. And he said, yes. And in that freedom that God honored, respected, and Adam also honored and respected, God brought him the animals to him and whatever he named them, that will be their names. Just think about how profound naming is. I hope to meet a, a lot of you brothers today, but the last thing that I will do is when I meet you is to tell you what your name is. I have no authority to name you. Your friends have no authority outside of nicknames, which is a, another great story. Naming can only be done through the right authority. And what happened here in this poetry is that when God created Adam and gave him dominion, from Genesis 1, dominion over the earth, you are my vicar. You have dominion to make this created world become all that it can be. He gave Adam authority. Authority comes from a Latin word, octure, octure. And Octuria has a, an interesting meaning. It means to author, to create, to engender, to make something that exists into, into existence. But it also means that you now have the duty to ensure the good of what you brought into creation. So the author of a book, the author of modern medicine, the author of a, a when you create something, it's not just creating it on its own, you now have the, the, the task the role, the mission, the vocation, the high honor of ensuring that good. And God had given that to Adam. And this is the first time that Adam is exercising it. It's the first time he's actually, he's naming, in the name of God, I name you giraffe. He's giving them a place in creation in the name of of God that he had been given in rightful authority. This is a key theme that I want to share with you today. That there is an authority 
that every baptized Christian has. But there's an authority in our manhood that must be understood and it must be claimed in order for other authorities to be lived. It's not because we have some super strength and, and we're, the, we're, the, we're the men, so we do it. God has made masculinity a unique and irreplaceable role in ensuring the good of all creation. I'll explain that. When Adam named the animals and gave them the place in existence, it changed him. It changed who he was and who he saw himself as. He might have known it in his head, who knows, but when he acted and named the animals, it awoke in him the realization, the recognition, literally he recognized, he renew who he was in the name of God. And that he has a duty, a role, a task, a mission, a high honor, an office to ensure the good of everything that was brought into creation by God. That's why when he named the animals, then God laid him down into the deep sleep as if he said, now you're ready. Now that you have experienced and encountered your unique role in creation, this masculine gift that engenders life and protects what is in existence, now you are ready to receive what you really are missing. Then God put Adam down into a deep sleep, reached into his side and pulled out the rib closed up his side, formed a body around this rib. Then God brought the woman to the man, and Adam exclaimed his song, This one, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my... That was a happy man. <laughs> that was a happy man. This is him singing. He had named all those animals looking for a helper fit for him. Now, it's crazy to us, but God is bringing him these body creatures, these animals, and he's looking for one that is worthy to be his helpmate. And he's looking in their eyes. He's seeing them. And he's looking in their eyes and seeing who they are and seeing there's nobody home. There's nobody home. You're, you're a beautiful triceratops, but there's nobody home. So when God brought the woman to the man, he says, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and I will call her woman, for out of man she came. That's a song, y'all. That's a song. But even dis not discounting the dense poetry, what is it that Adam saw without any questions, without any query? What did he see in a moment that allowed him to exclaim this beautiful song of praise? This is a beautiful meditation on what sight was before sin entered the world. The next line says, they were both naked and felt no shame. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and the two shall become one flesh. That's actually first. And then, they were both naked and felt no shame. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his... For what reason? For what reason? It's not entirely clear in the English. But if you scratch the surface, even to the Hebrew, there's something profound going on that we have to understand. Up until the point where God formed the woman, in the Hebrew, Adam was named... Adam, Adam ha. But it says in the Hebrew that God brought Ish ah to Ish. God, the Lord God, brought Ish ah to Ish. Who's Ish ah and who's Ish? God changed Adam's name, changed his name at the moment that he brought this new creature to him. And interestingly, the names Ish and Isha 
use the exact same Hebrew characters, exact same Hebrew characters. And the only difference between Ish and Isha is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the Yud. The Greeks call it the iota, the Yud. So even in the, the language of the Hebrew, we see that God names Adam, renames him, in light and in relation to this new creature. Now, pause. What do we know about God renaming? When God changes someone's name from Abram to Abraham, from Saul to, oh, that was a little different. That's a Hebrew name. From Jacob to Israel. Our scriptures from the Old Testament to the New are replete with these moments where God names someone, renames them. And from that moment on, their name carries with it a meaning that is their task, role, mission, high office for the rest of their lives. This is powerful. When God changes your name, it's on. It, it's, you know, if the Holy Father came through this door right now and walked through the crowd, scooted across the people and put his hand on your shoulder and says, I need you to do something for me. You think that would be different? You think that would be different? You would live the rest of your life. The Holy Father told me. And I'm telling you because the Holy Father told me to tell you. And people say, oh, mind your business, Damon. No, 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 no. The Holy Father told me to tell you. That's not just a task. That's not just a role. That's not just a mission or even a vocation. Those are all wonderful things. But when you are placed with that high authority from someone in higher authority, and you accept it, it changes your entire life. And in this circumstance, God brings ish ah to ish. And he sees with his own eyes that this creature, this creature, reveals to him more about himself and all of creation than anything he's seen before. In one gaze, in one gaze. John Paul says, Adam, Ish was able to look upon Ish ah with all of the peace of an interior gaze. He saw her. And in seeing her, he saw himself in a way that he could never see alone. He saw that his masculinity only made sense in light of femininity. He saw that what it means to be a man made male takes all of its meaning in light of man made female and vice versa. In other words, he experienced communion, a meeting of equals, and it's not merely biological. Yes, they were both naked and felt no shame. That was the revelation. Their bodies, like ours are now, are a revelation of this capacity and call to communion. But the communion is as deep as the person, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, physically. Everything that makes us an I can be possessed and can be given and can be entered into communion with. And Adam saw all of that with one gaze. And in looking upon this woman, he sang his song because it's as if the entire universe, this is not an overstatement, the entire universe opened up at once. And that same revelation, that same eye awakening, that same recognition is what brings our dry bones to life, the stuff of our Catholic faith, to the vibrant, on-fire follower of Jesus Christ. It's being able to see everything in creation with new eyes. It's to be able to hear with new ears. And we don't do this by just trying harder. I'm really going to look hard now, and then I'm, oh, I got it. Well, if we did that, who needs God? It is a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift. And it's a gift of more than what we deserve. That beautiful opening and creation story, we have to begin there in our faith. If we look at our lives now and try to figure out what it means to be Christian, what it means to be a follower of Christ, if we look at our own world now and try to figure out what's good and true and beautiful, we never will. 
We're thinking, it's, it's, we just got to cope. We got to cope with what we have now because this is just the way the world is. Well, what if it wasn't in the beginning? What if the world was very different in the beginning? The creation stories gives us a glimpse of what God created. So that when we get to Genesis chapter 3, we feel it right in our hearts of what was lost. And we see that the very enemy of God, a creature, not a divine, a creature, enemy of God, attacks the creatures on the net in the visible world that are the most image and likeness of God. Why? Because he hates God. He's not going after the trees. He's going after the man and the woman who now have the capacity to enter into their own communion. He knows that God is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. That's not a revelation to him. He knows the Father is Father because everything comes from him. Everything. And everything that comes from God the Father can only be received by God himself, the Son. And he knows, this enemy, that God, the Father and Son outside of time are this communion of Father and Son giving and receiving, giving and receiving. It's not the Father giving. The Father is the total pouring out of, who, of himself. The Son is the total receiving of the Father and glorifying him back. The Father and the Son are this dynamism of giving and receiving, giving and receiving. It's who they are, not what they do. The Father and the Son outside of time, giving and receiving, giving and receiving. And the very giving and receiving of the Father and the Son actually exists. This is what we say every Sunday. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the author, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The deepest truth about God is that He's Father and Son in such communion, in such unity that the very giving and receiving exists as this life-giving divine person. So if this is who God is, this dynamic communion of persons, now God in the created world makes man and woman human persons, equal but distinct, so that the man and the woman can enter into their own communion. And the giving and receiving of the man and the woman is so real. The giving and receiving of the man and the woman in the image and likeness of God is so real that God willing in nine months you have to name it. In the image and likeness of God is that the communion of persons is not just a moment, it's not just a code word for sexual union, it's being fruitful and multiplying in the image and likeness of God. This is the equivalent of God putting his hand on your shoulder, man, and asking you to become who you are. Become who you are. I created you to enter into communion so that you can come to know who you are first, then to possess who you are second, so that you can give yourself away so that life can exist outside of you. Self-knowledge, self-possession, self-gift. Self-knowledge, self-possession, self-gift. This is the Christian life. This is the encounter that brings the dry bones of our faith alive into our hearts. That doesn't mean that everyone enters into the sacrament of marriage. The sacrament of marriage is a sign of what this communion is, but it's a sign. Signs always point to a greater reality than themselves. Signs are not reality in of themselves, they point us to something even greater. Which means that every man, every man is called to come to know who he is in the unique and unrepeatable self. You're meant to use and work the virtues 
so that you can come to have possession of yourself. That you're not a victim of the weather or from your moods or from your desires, but you have a self-possession where you can freely choose the good. And the greatest free choice that we can make is to give ourselves away. This is a theology that helps us understand all of the why coaches, I had a football coach, two coaches in my past that have changed my life. My Boy Scout leader, my own father, men who have come out of themselves in the physical, who are my biological father, and in the spiritual to give Damon life at different points of my life. And I submit to you, men, that this is the call of every man. Every man is called to become a spiritual father. And spiritual doesn't mean be team. Every man is called to be a giver of life so that life can exist outside of you and then to take the duty, the vocation to ensure the good of. We have a duty in relationship one to another to make sure that we have possession of ourselves so that we can love. Love is self-gift. How much do we give? More. Well, how much do we get? More. How much can we know ourselves? More. How much more possession can we have? More. More, more. Not as the heavy yoke that takes us to places we don't want to go, but with a yoke that's easy and takes us to a place that gives us the deepest joy that we could never, we never thought we could have. This is what God promises. That if we follow him and allow him to lead us, he will show us the deepest truth of who we are by showing us the deepest truth of who he is. And he will give us a task, a mission, a call, a vocation. He will put his hand on our shoulder and give us the authority to do what we could never do on our own. And it will bring us more joy than we can realize. And we will be able to love more than we can on our own. This, to close, this is how I want to invite you to understand mercy. This is how I want to invite you to understand mercy. My, almost my whole life, I thought justice and mercy were these, these strangely opposing virtues. I thought to be merciful means somehow it, you don't get what you deserve, and, and to, be, to, be, to be just means that you can't be merciful, right? Justice is the virtue of giving others what they're rightly due, right? We read that from the catechism. To giving God and others what they're rightly due. That's justice. And for most of my life, I thought mercy was saying, uh, I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to pardon you for that. That's not what mercy is. Mercy builds on top of justice. Justice is the virtue of giving others what they're rightly due and God. Mercy is the virtue of giving God and others more than what they're rightly due. That's why you can't have mercy without justice. How do you know you're giving more unless you've acknowledged what you're rightly do? And we can only give more in the name of God because God is mercy. In the name of Jesus, I give you more. In the name of Jesus, I give you more. That to me is the mantra. That is the call of every Christian man. I can't give you more because I, everything I receive from God, I give to you. And I give you more because God has given me more. And we don't worry about balancing justice and mercy. When we exercise mercy, we have fulfilled justice. Just as when we have loved, we have fulfilled the law. Our masculinity, men, is a sign from the very beginning and will be a sign all the way till the redemption. And where we live now, how we live now, everyone that God has put into our lives now, everyone that God has put into our lives now is an occasion for us to receive more mercy from God so that we can give more mercy to others, to give others more than what they are rightly due. And because no one can do that outside of God, every time we do that, 
we are acting in the person of God. And when we act in the person of God, he changes us. Not just with a new baptismal name, not just with a new confirmation name, but with a name that we've written in the book for eternity. We will come to know who we are in relation to others, and the first relation is before God to receive our identity so that we can give others their own identity. And in order to do that, we have to avail ourselves of everything the church has given us, everything that God has given us for us to come closer to Him. Confession, the Eucharist, prayer, the liturgy, everything that God has given us. And above that, fellowship. This Christian walk for us men is not a lone ranger business. It's a posse business. You need somebody, two, three men, that you can get spiritually naked with. That together, we can help one another. That we can help to live this incredible call that God has given us. And in the name of Jesus, I implore you, come to know what he's asked you to do. And when you receive that call, you will come to know him and yourself more than you have ever known anything before. And it will be a revelation of all of the rest of creation. And that, that is a joyful life. That is a life filled with joy. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this great gift of our masculinity. We thank you for this great call from the very beginning that you've infused in us, stamped into us. May we come to see it with new eyes. May we come to know it with a new, deeper heart and meaning. May we always receive the mercy that you would have us to give to others. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you all.